guarantee that you can. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you. I'm Julian Sabalescu, the, the Hero Chair in Practical Ethics, uh, to tonight's St. Cross uh, seminar, or is it? Uh, it's the Hero Centre and Welcome Centre for Ethics. Uh, sorry, sorry, you Hero, so many seminars. Uh, you Hero <laughs> and uh, Welcome Centre for Human Ethics and Humanities uh, seminar. To um, Professor Steve Clark, a longtime uh, member of the New Hero Centre, now at Charles Sturt University, where he's professor um, in the Centre for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics. Um, and uh, for those of you who know Steve, he's you know, very well published, author of over 60 papers in, in refereed journals and, and two books, um, Justification of Religious Violence with um, Wiley Blackwell and co-editor of four books. Um, one of them from an AHRC project we had together. So tonight he'll talk about hope in healthcare. There'll be about 45 minutes of talk and uh, 45 minutes of discussion. Steve. Thank you, Julian. Um, so this is joint work I've done with uh, Justin Oakley at Monash. Now, Justin, uh, many of you will have met Justin and if you haven't met Justin, you may have read his many contributions to bioethics. So, um, Acknowledging him as a walking of the paper. So, this is a paper about the importance of hope in healthcare. Now, a lot of people will tell you this. They'll say um, it's really important that patients who are undergoing some kind of significant medical, medical procedure uh, hope for a successful outcome. Okay, I hear this, you know, a lot of times, and it's uh, bioethicists all. I've never heard someone who's flat out denied it. A lot of people just simply agree with it. A lot of healthcare professionals uh, will say this as well. So really important that they hope for the, you know, a good outcome. But um, it's not clear why this is the case. Why is hope so important? If indeed it is, and we should be open-minded about this, maybe hope's not important in the way we think it is. Um, now, what we're going to do, what Justin and I are going to do, is propose a hitherto unrecognised explanation, or as far as we're aware, <laughs> no one else has come up with it, but it's always possible that they come up with it and kept it from, kept it from us, that's possible. <laughs> um, uh, and a hitherto unrecognised explanation for the importance of patients' position of hope for successful treatment. And this appeals to prospect theory. So prospect theory, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a uh, descriptive theory about decision-making in situations of risk and uncertainty. It's probably uh, the most influential descriptive theory. Uh, so often contrasted with expected utility theory, uh, but expected utility theory is often meant said to be a normative theory as well as descriptive theory. Whereas prospect theory is usually just said to be a descriptive theory of how people make decisions under situations of risk and uncertainty. So we're going to appeal to this theory, and I'll go through the basics of it. And those of you who are familiar with that already, then you just kind of tune out for a few minutes at that point. Okay. Now, this talk is about hope in healthcare, specifically about patients' hope. Uh, for successful outcomes. So it's quite narrowly targeted. However, the analysis we're going to provide uh, might well work in other contexts. So we're just open-minded about this. Um, there are certainly other contexts in which people run around saying hope is important. So here's a couple of that have been mentioned. Um, hope in military leadership. So it's often claimed that it's very important that military leaders hope that they're going to be successful. Clearly, if they're, uh, they're not hopeful of success or they're despairing, uh, then uh, that, that sounds like a very bad thing intuitively. So people keep saying this. And also elite athletes, they'll often say, you know, you really have to hope that you're going to win. Once you cease hoping for victory or, you know, the sort of reality sets in, that, um, you know, you're facing the world champion and that your chances are very slim, um, then things go wrong. You've got to hope, okay? And there might be other contexts as well where hope is important. Completely open-minded about that, but we're just focusing on this um, one context where we think hope is important. Other thing to say is we seem to have a sort of a weird sidebar crossing some of my uh, 
it's all my words here, but um, we're going to assume that, and this is a really uncontroversial assumption, but I need to say this because I've read this paper somewhere else and people kept bringing it up, um, is that the point of healthcare <laughs> is to restore people to good health. It's, it doesn't have some other purpose. So um, the healthcare system is set up to get people back to good health. It's not for human enhancement or some other purpose. Okay. So the very people who keep saying that hope is health uh, is important in healthcare are the same people who say that healthcare is designed around this uncontroversial assumption of restoring people's health. Thanks, Andy. Okay. Oh, I seem to have a. Now we're stuck. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Now, so let's go. Okay, so if you start reading the literature on hope in philosophy, there is said to be a standard account. So that's going to be the jumping off point here. So here's a take on the standard account by Eve Garrard and co-author. A person hopes for a state of affairs P, if and only if she desires that P and believes that it is possible, though not certain, that P will come about. So if you're not desiring it, you're not hoping. And if you think it's certain to come about, you're not hoping. It's, you know, it's in the bag. It's not, not something you're hopeful about. So it has to be something less than certainty. Okay. Now, straight away, this doesn't seem right to me. It's not, there's not enough going on. And what's missing, and I'm not the first person to point this out, is any mention of the affect, affective dimension of hope. So think about this. So you've got two patients and a thought experiment, they're the same patient. Patient number one, patient A, believes that there's a 1% chance that her malignant tumours will be successfully treated. And this is something she desires. And um, so she fits the, uh, the standard definition pretty straightforwardly. And she's hopeful. She says, ah, there's a 1% chance. This is great. Uh, so she hopes, she approaches her impending operation with a sense of hope of success in the face of great odds of failure. The patient too, exact same circumstances, believes there's a 1% chance that malignant tumours will be successfully treated, um, but she finds herself in a state of despair. There's only a 1% chance. She abandons hope. Now, intuitively, these people are very different. The first one is a genuine case of hope. The second one, they're not in a state of hope. What's the difference? It's a different uh, affective state, okay? A uh, different emotional engagement with the information that's been presented. Okay, they've been presented with the exact same information um, and they don't have the uh, exact same outcome they want, but they have different emotional reactions. And intuitively, the first one is hope and the second one is despair. Okay, a different thing. Now, here's a definition which we think is much more plausible, and this comes from Adrienne Martin. So she says, to hope for an outcome is to desire, be attracted to it, assign a probability somewhere between zero and one. I take it she means not including one, because that's uncertainty. <laughs> um, and to judge that there are sufficient reasons to engage in certain feelings and activities directed towards it. Okay, so the judgment is driving an emotional engagement. Okay, now, Martin contrasts her view with the standard view. She also contrasts it with a view that's dominant in academic psychology. So if you read into this, there's uh, someone called Richard Snyder, who's the big hope poobah in psychology. He's written great reams of papers about hope and books and things. And he's got a big school around him, uh, the hope theorists. And this is a definition from him and some of his co-authors. Hope is a goal-oriented cognitive construct with affective and behavioral implications. Now, Adrian Martin, Contrasts of views. She doesn't like this view, but we think very similar. Okay, so she's hoping for an outcome. Uh, Snyder and co-authors uh, have a goal-oriented cognitive construct. An outcome and a goal, pretty much the same thing. Okay, so we think she shouldn't um, 
contrast it. She's right to contrast it with the standard account, but wrong to make such a big uh, song and dance about the difference between her view and the psychology view. Okay, so swing around here. Um, so, um, so we, we don't see what the fuss is about. We think you should get different psychologists. Okay, now you might have an objection to this because not all uses of the term hope, the word hope, seem to motivate goal-oriented behavior, okay? So if I say, look, I hope for good weather tomorrow, okay? Just feeling like, that. I hope there's some good weather. I'd like to have a nice day with some good weather. I hope for that. I'm saying that despite having no understanding, fully understanding, I have no capacity to influence the weather whatsoever, okay? So it's not plausibly, um, a goal for me. It's not my goal to cause good weather tomorrow. Okay, so the hope is not goal oriented in any way whatsoever. Okay, so as a definition, um, this doesn't seem to us to uh, do the work that's needed, but we're not interested in giving you an exacting definition of hope. Okay, what we're interested in is a particular form of goal-oriented behaviour. Okay? Patient hope for successful treatment. What we think is going on is that um, when patients hope for successful treatment, they're getting with the program. They're engaging in a series of activities that will be part of their procedure for treatment. So they're consenting to the operation. They're going along with whatever the rehabilitation process that is afterwards. It might be a series of exercises, going on some kind of restrictive diet or otherwise restricting your behaviour to ensure that you're know, taking uh, various forms of medication for a period of time after the operation and so on. Um, and that's the goal-oriented behaviour. So we're interested in this subclass of hope, which we think is captured by um, the psychologists pretty well. So we're on board with the psychologists. <clears throat> but we acknowledge that um, someone who was more concerned to pin down an exact, uh, you know, um, analytic definition of hope of necessary and sufficient conditions uh, would need something slightly different from this. Okay, but that's not our purpose. Okay, now. Let's get on to just looking at some reasons that have been given and suggesting the literature on why hope is so important. Okay, so this is some stuff people say. <clears throat> so one of the things they say is that, look, there are psychological benefits of having hope. Okay, so why is it important for patients to have hope? Well, if they, if they have hope, they'll get these psychological benefits. Now, we don't think this is a good response. And the problem is not that there may not be psychological uh, benefits of hope. It's just that it's very difficult to tease them out from the benefits that come along with optimism. Okay? So a hopeful person is uh, almost invariably an optimistic person. There's lots of studies that show that optimism has health benefits in various ways. Um, and so as far as we can tell, um, it's optimism that's probably doing the work of uh, providing health benefits. It's possible that hope is adding something to it, but it's just very good, very difficult to get clear data that um, separates this out. <clears throat> so we think this, there might be something to this um, uh, explanation, but it's just very difficult to prove it. Okay. A second thing people say is that it's really important to avoid despair. Okay, um, so there's a recent uh, paper on hope which uh, runs this line, and the author, whose name I'm blanking on, draws on this stuff by this guy from Victor Frankel, who right, right, survived a concentration camp. And um, according to Frankel, the important thing for him in surviving uh, was having hope. And he points out, and on this gruesome story, that there were many members, uh, many people who were stuck in the concentration camp who fell into a state of despair about their miserable lives and prospects. 
So what happened is when they fell into the state of despair, according to Frankel, um, they just ceased sort of trying. So the concentration camp guards would instruct them to do this, that or the other, and they just wouldn't do it. And the guards would hit them with the butt of their rifles and they just sort of fall on the ground and do nothing. Um, and they're basically just, um, you know, they've, they've entered a state of despair that they realise that there's just no good future for them, so they figure out, well, who cares? Okay? And, you know, they don't survive very long after this. So Frankel's story is that hope is very important because it helps you avoid despair. Now, we think that's all true. It's just that we also think there's a neutral state, which is between hope and despair, okay? Um, which is neither hoping um, for that a procedure is successful, nor despairing that it's going to be unsuccessful. And what we would like is an explanation that picks out the hopeful state from the neutral state as well as the despairing state. So we don't think that pointing out the badness of despair is sufficient to tell you about the goodness of hope, okay? Because we also want to know why hope is better than the, the neutral state. Okay, now here's the third thing that is said, which we endorse. We don't think this is the full story, but we endorse this. Hope motivates patients to cooperate with healthcare professionals to achieve the goal of regaining a stable good health. So it's motivation. And we think this is clearly right. The patient who is hopeful, they're going to be motivated. They're going to try harder to participate in their rehabilitation. They'll take the regular exercise, they'll stick to the restrictive diets, or take regular medication for longer periods of time. The patient who's in, in despair certainly won't do this. They'll say, what's the point? And the patient who's in the neutral state, well, you know, they might do it if they've got nothing better to do, but they're not particularly going to be motivated to do all this stuff. They do regular exercises and restrictive diet, you know, no alcohol, mushy food, or whatever it is. Um, we think you need hope. You need to be focused on the goal of the pain of uh, restoring yourself to good health. To, uh, to get this. So we think this motivation story is good. So we force this, we just think it's not the whole story. Okay, what is the whole story? Well, this is where prospect theory comes in. So this is the bit where you can tune out if you can do the prospect theory. Okay, let's start with the well-known aging disease problem. <coughs> so this is from Kane and Tversky. Imagine that the, this is their little uh, study. Imagine that the US preparing for an outbreak of an unusual Asian disease, which is expected to kill 600 people. Two alternative programs to combat the disease have been proposed. Assume that the exact scientific estimates of the consequences of the programs are as follows. Program A is adopted, 200 people will be saved. Program B is a one third probability that 600 will be saved and a two thirds probability that no people will be saved. So that's your choice. Your research subject, you're given these choices. Now, turns out that most people prefer program A in these choices. So, what's going on is that program A is the safe bet. Okay, You'll, uh, you're making a recommendation. This is the safe bet, it'll save 200. Program B um, will save 200 on average, okay, but it's the risky bet. Okay. Um, so um, there's a two thirds chance you'll save no one, all 600 are gonna die. But there's a one third chance you'll save them all. That's the risky bit. Most people don't take the risky bit, they like the safe bit. Okay. Now, tell the story slightly differently. Same scenario, and you first need run this. Program C is adopted, 600, 400 people will die. Program D is adopted, one third probability that no one will die, and a two thirds probability that 600 people will die. Now, if you tell the story this way, given the same scenario, but you use the will die language rather than will be saved, you know, flip the script around, people have very different choices. So this time, 22% of the subjects preferred C, okay, um, which is the safe bet. Okay, because 400 will die, that's 200 will be saved. 
and 78% um, take the risky route, take program D. Now, so what's gone on is that this subtle switch of wording has switched people, most people, from being risk averse to risk seeking. Okay? Now, the big question is, how has this happened? How has this little uh, switch in language had this extraordinary effect? Well, this is, uh, this is the explanation, which is the sort of dominant view, and uh, it again comes from Kane and Tversky. They say this, they make three core claims. This is the guts of prospect theory. We evaluate risk in comparison to a reference point. Outcomes that are understood as superior to the reference points are regarded as gains. Outcomes that are understood as being inferior are regarded as losses. We're loss averse. Okay, so losing hurts us psychologically more than winning benefits us psychologically. So Kahneman in his book, he cites the case of Jimmy Connors, who apparently famously said, um, I hate to lose more than I love to win. Okay, now apparently we're all Jimmy Connors. Okay, <laughs> so um, we, um, we all feel more uh, the, the badness of losing than the goodness of winning. So I think a lot of academics can kind of relate to this. You get that rejection letter from a journal and you feel much more about it than an acceptance. It makes you feel good, okay? Now, third thing is we experience diminishing sensitivity to gains and losses in proportion to relative distance from the reference point. So if it's zero dollars is the reference point, first $10 we might gain or lose, has more psychological, psychological significance than the next $10 and so on. So putting that all together, you get a chart that looks like this, okay? So the key things here to understand is you've got your reference point. That's the point in which in your head, you switch from gains to losses, okay? So a gain, um, is what's going on above the line, a loss is below the line, and the curve below the line is steeper. Okay, so the losses are harming you more, you're feeling them more, and you're benefiting from the gains. So you like gains, but you hate losses more. That's the idea. Now, according to Kahneman and Tversky, this is a kind of a hardwired figure, feature of ordinary human psychology. It's not just a few people who like this, will like this. Okay. This just so this is this is the guts of prospect theory. It's descriptive theory of how we try and evaluate uh, how we make decisions under states of risk and uncertainty is that um, we weigh it intuitively like this. We try and avoid losses at all costs, but we'd like to make some gains. Okay, now your usual reference point is the status quo whatever the current situation is. So <clears throat> suppose you're lucky enough to own one property. Okay, that's your reference point. Now, you are going to do a lot more to prevent loss than to make gain. Okay, so you, you might, you've got your one property and say you don't have any debt on it. You might be able to take out a big mortgage to buy a second property. Okay. And you know, you might do that if you think, well, you know, I can lock in a low interest rate and like, it's all very safe. But you're not going to do it if it's all risky. You'll be risk averse in regard to that sort of decision. But think about a threat to the status quo, to your ownership of that one property. Suppose, I don't know, a bank tries to foreclose on your loan, something like that, for whatever reason, you know. You're you get the letter saying you're not making the payments, you have to do this or turfing them out and sell the property for money you fit. Okay, you're going to move heaven or earth to stop that. Okay, because that's your status quo, that one property. So the idea is that um, that's your reference point. Uh, so uh, status quo, particularly in down what you consider what you own, is uh, often a reference point for people, and from that point you become uh, loss averse and you uh, are risk averse, from, so you're risk seeking below the reference point to try and prevent losses below the reference point and risk averse in respect of the gains. Now, 
As we've seen with Asian flu, the reference point can be shifted. So what's going on there is it's a kind of a little trick of language. So when you use the, um, the phrase, let's go back and I'll see if we show you this, um, will die, um, this, um, this makes people risk seeking because the phrase will die makes you think the reference point is that people are alive, okay? So you become risk seeking below the reference point. You want to prevent those deaths. However, the language will be saved. What's the reference point? Well, intuitively, that they're gonna die. They're not saved, okay? So the reference point is now that they're as good as dead. So, um, so you are just going to be, you're not gonna be risk seeking in regard to making those savings, okay? So if you're risk seeking, you're preventing losses. And this language shifts the way you think, but it does it, I mean, 99 out of 100 people are not gonna realize this is going on, and yet it's going on. Okay, so Asian, the Asian flu reframing, that's a way of shifting a reference point. Another example of the way in which a reference point can shift is through, um, acquisition of an expectation. So let's go back to the, you're owning that one property. Now, suppose um, you, uh, your parents tell you, look, um, when we die, uh, we're going to, you're going to inherit a second property. Now, you think, well, that's all very well, you know, my parents are healthy, whatever, that's not going to happen anytime soon. So you don't really think about it. It's just kind of sounds nice, but you, you know, you don't really want to lose your parents, but um, you, uh, you kind of have that thought back here. So it's not really doing any work. But suppose now they actually, you know, um, you hear from a doctor, look, you're both your parents, I know they've got this killer new strain of COVID and they're not going to be around for longer than a week. Okay, well, you're, you're obviously pretty upset. But another thing that's going on, this is the silver lining, is that you start, you know, banking that, uh, that extra house. You think, okay, my reference point has moved now. Uh, so my reference point now, based on rational expectation, is that I have two properties. Even though it's not quite yours, it's not in the bag, it, you can't think it's in the bag. But suppose, you know, a strange cousin comes along and challenges the will. They say, um, look, um, that, uh, that Steve Clark, uh, the ne'er do well, you know, um, this thing about thinking the property, they, they kind of meant this, um, and they produced this alternative will. Now, at that point, because your reference point has shifted, um, again, you consider this a loss if you've banked this in, in your head as, as good as yours. So you're now going to move heaven on earth, you lawyer up, get the best lawyers to get rid of this dodgy relative uh, because this is uh, now your reference point. However, when it was just a sort of distant thought in the back of your head and you weren't sort of banking on the uh, property will, it didn't play this role. Okay? If you'd heard that the cousin was sort of schmoozing with your parents and, um, you know, you suspected that, you know, yeah, that's a bit suspicious. Uh, what are they doing? Um, you're not really going to be too fussed about it. You might sort of, the flag pops up, but nothing. Okay. So expectations can change reference points. Another thing that can change reference points is goals. Now, so a good, this is a good example of this is running. So suppose you are a keen long distance runner. I'm not, I've had operations on two of my knees. I do not do this, but it's not gonna stop me using the example. Suppose you're running, you're a regular runner and you want to, you know, you've got a goal. You're kind of increasing the distance you run every, every week or whatever, and you're up to five Ks. You wanna run five Ks. And it's a bit of a challenge for you. Well, you do understand that you might, uh, to reach this goal, might incur some kind of injuries. There are a there is a danger. Tearing your hamstring, banging up your knee, or whatever it is, athletes, whatever it is, you you you, you take these risks. 
But because you've set yourself a goal, that's now going to serve as your reference point. So your goal is in your head, I've got to run 5Ks. You will take risks with your health to get the goal, reach the goal. However, suppose you've hit your goal and you're still feeling pretty good about running. If you think, actually, I could run a bit more, a bit further. You might do it, but you're not going to risk your health doing that because you've already achieved your goal. Your goal in your back of your head was, I'm going to run 5Ks. So another K, yeah, you might do it if you're feeling good and you think this is low risk, but you're not going to be sort of, say, oh, you know, I might really um, tear up my knee if I do this. You just stop. Okay. So the goal is setting the reference point. Okay. So different ways in which reference points can shift around are very important for how you assess risk, according to prospect theory, which has got a truckload of evidence for it. Okay. Now, is there evidence that uh, goals can serve as reference points? Yes. So this is a well-known study by some people called Pope and Schweitzer, and they, believe it or not, they examined 2.5 million golf putts using laser measurements. Now, the reason was this. A professional golfer um, is expected to get a par round, a round of golf, so 18 holes, is supposed to get par. So for those of you who don't know the game, every hole is a, it's sort of rated. You're either supposed to get to the hole in three, four, or five shots, and that's par for the hole. And professionally, you know, most people like me that suck, they, uh, they you know, double bogeys most of the time, so two, two extra shots per hole. But a professional golfer, uh, this is what they expect. So that's their goal, so hope and schmutz so reason. Now, if that's right, if the professional golfer's goal is to get a pass score on a given hole, they are going to take more risks to ensure they don't incur a loss, that they don't get a worse score, get a bogey as it's known in golf, than the risks they will take to get a better than par score, a boom. Or if you know your golf, uh, if it's two under par, a, uh, an eagle. So, um, so, um, so they looked at these putts, these 2.5 million putts, and indeed this is what they found. They found that um, there was more of a chance of overshooting the hole when you were going, when you're really going for it, when you're faced with the threat of um, uh, getting an overpass score, the loss as it were, than um, the underpass score. The, um, um, the, the sort of bonus game, okay? And the reason is that, um, you know, you want to make sure to make sure you get the pass score that your ball travels at least as far as the hole. So you incur the danger of overshooting. Whereas if you're putting for under par, you might just be happy just to lay up the ball before the hole. Okay? so that if it's, you know, a couple of inches short, then you can just tap it in, okay? Now, interestingly, some professional golfers are aware of this and they will defend it. So this is probably the only philosophy paper uh, you've been to where Tiger Woods has been cited, but uh, <laughs> here is Tiger, who is sure we thought a bit about golf. He says, anytime you make big par putts, I think it's more important to make are those than birdie putts. I don't ever want to drop a shot. The psychological difference between dropping shot and making a birdie, I think it's just bigger to make a par putt. Okay? So basically he's endorsing prospect theory right there. So my goal is par, um, and I really don't want to get below par, got to do that. But you know, birdie, um, under par, that's kind of bonus. Okay? So he's aware of what's going on and he's endorsing it. Right, let's bring this back to medicine. Now, in healthcare, and some evidence for this, um, by the way, I should have said, uh, there's quite a lot of evidence about prospect theory and healthcare. Lots of people thought prospect theory is important to healthcare, and they've written various studies uh, trying to show how it's important in this or that way. Um, this, this is the first one, as far as we're aware, it's about hope. 
Okay, but these people tread well in Leonard. They are interested for other reasons in where's the reference point, and they think for most people, reference point is your current state of health. So for most people, you think I'm in this current state of health. Um, yeah, I'd like to be in a better state of health. That'd be great, but I really don't want to get worse. Okay, so think about weight. You know, it'd be nice if I lost a few pounds, but I really don't want to gain weight. Okay, that, that's the worst thing for me. So I'm more motivated to try and prevent myself from putting on weight than I'm motivated to, um, uh, to lose weight. So, so that's a kind of a, a common thing. So for most people, current state of health is your reference point. Now, if you take off, patient takes on the goal of returning to their former state of health, then their reference point shifts. And they're going to become risk-seeking in regard to an outcome that falls short of that goal. Okay, so get the idea. So if a healthcare professional can persuade them to take on the goal of returning to their former state of health, then that's going to shift their reference point and they're going to become more risk-seeking than they would otherwise be in regard uh, to, to getting there. So they'll be more willing to accept the risks of side effects that might uh, come along with an operation, but be more willing to risk side effects that might go along with taking medication, and they'll be more willing to um, undertake exercises that might you know, backfire and cause them further injuries as part of the rehabilitation than they would be otherwise be. So we think this is another thing that's important about health, about hope. Hope makes you uh, hope for a goal of uh, it better in restoring yourself to good health makes you uh, more risk seeking in ways that alter the decision that you make, makes you more likely to go along with a proposed healthcare program that involves more risks to you than you otherwise be. So, hope sets goals, goal shift reference points, changing attitudes to risk. Okay. So that's the other reason we think so hope is important because it's motivational, but it's also important because it changes your attitudes to risk. Okay. Now, having said all this, we now think we can pin down what the difference is between the absence of hope and despair. And um, so this is a bit of a side issue, but it's kind of interesting to, uh, to fix on this. So, a patient who has no particular hope of recovery, but you know, his recovery is possible, they're not in a state of despair, but it's not in a state of despair. They're, they're just at the status quo. Their reference point is where their health is right now. Okay? But a patient who's in a state of despair has accepted an effect that their health will further deteriorate. So their reference point is where in their head is the rational expectation. I think it's going to end up. Okay. So uh, the concentration camp uh, victims who are in despair, they just assume their reference point is now dead. Okay. And other people who um, are in a state of despair about their health, uh, their reference point is going to be wherever they think their state of health is going to end up after whatever disease they had. Okay. Um, so that's the difference, we think, between um, being in the neutral state, between hope and despair, and being in despair. Right. And that's just a little side there. Okay. Now, given that um, imbuing a patient with hope can change their attitudes to risk, um, there's surely concerns about manipulation. Now, there's already a literature about this, but it plays out slightly different. There's quite a literature about uh, what's known as false hope. So false hope is you know, when, uh, if, uh, say, a doctor makes stuff up for the patient or uh, gives them sort of very unrealistic assessments of things. Okay, so, it's in, so there's already literature. So we're concerned with something slightly different. We're concerned with this issue about um, you can manipulate a patient by moving the reference point and could you do so inappropriately? Okay. Now, so patients will often, so as we've noted, 
considering their options, patients will often use new goals, reference point, be more willing to take greater risks to achieve that goal, raises concerns about manipulation, particularly if they are led to accept risks by means that they do not endorse. Now, but there are going to be situations where this is absolutely fine. Okay? It's not wrongful in the average case to inspire someone with hope. Okay? Um, so suppose, think about this patient, a doctor. Um, so here's patient A. Patient A has an advanced cancer which is proven resistant to most available treatment. And all that remains are drugs which are very unlikely to cure her cancer and highly likely to cause her premature death. So she's in a bad way. She no longer has hope that there'll be a cure for her. Okay? So her reference point, she's not in a state of despair. She's just lacking hope. Her reference point stays quo. So you come along and you say to her, well, you know, there's this other possible drug therapy you could take, but there's very high risk of side effects, blah, blah, blah. Um, then um, she's probably going to be unwilling to try it because she's thinking, what's the point? More drugs, more side effects. I don't want to do, I don't want to do this. Um, now, suppose the doctor, though, for patient A, provides her with access to a promising new drug that's being trialed, which appears to be far less likely to cause premature death, has some side effects, but they don't seem to be as bad as the others. Um, that's a different story. So... <coughs> The doctor may be able to infuse patient over the grounds for hope. Say, look, we know all those drug therapies that have been proven out there in the market. They're, they're pretty bad. They have these terrible side effects. But this one that's in trial it's really seems promising. Yeah, there are some side effects, but we really think you should try this. Okay? Now, if the doctor can persuade the patient to take this, then that's going to change their attitude to risk, make them more likely to take it. So this is where... The doctor infused the question of manipulation arises. Now, we think in most cases, uh, this is perfectly fine. It's morally acceptable because if the doctor just straightforwardly says to the patient, here are the, you know, here is the risks, the known risks of taking this new, uh, uh, this new drug, here are the known side effects, here's what we know about the chances. Um, you know, might not work, but it might well, much better than the other therapies, the patient is in effect making a rational decision. Now, what's going to happen if she is inspired by hope is she's going to move from risk, uh, risk averse to risk seeking. Uh, but we don't think that's a problem because um, according to prospect theory, all of us are already both risk seeking and risk averse, just under different circumstances. Um, so it's not irrational to be risk seeking. It's not irrational to be risk averse. And this is, you know, this perfectly sort of normal procedure. Uh, every one of us has the experience of, you know, acquiring hope and um, changing our behavior on the basis. Of we think this is perfectly normal uh, procedure, which can be quite consistent with rationality and can be something that she can rationally choose. Okay. So we don't think in the main case this is a problem. The patient, the key thing is the patient endorses it. Okay. However, um, there might be some variations on this which uh, are not good. Now, um, this is a paper, frankly, this is, this is Justin stuff. He's very impressed by this, someone called Rudino from 1978. Uh, I did not find this, but... Um, He's got an account of manipulation. Okay. A attempts to manipulate S, F, and only S. A attempts the complex motivation of S's behavior by means of deception or playing on a supposed weakness of S. Um, that is, attempting to motivate someone's behavior in a way which presumably which proves will alter uh, the person's project. Now, so think about this. So the worry here is this playing on the supposed weakness. Suppose the doctor finds out that the patient has a tendency to clutch at straws. They clutch at straws as in, you tell them about um, a little prospect and they immediately jump on it without sort of thinking it through. So you say to the patient, well, you know, you've tried all those main therapies and all that produced these bad side effects. Uh, 
but there's this uh, new drug in trial and the patient goes, yes, I want it, uh, without thinking it through, okay? Then that's, that's a worry, because if the doctor is aware of this and there's a potential to exploit, to manipulate the patient, their, their uh, tendency to clutch at straws. And you, you could imagine a doctor doing this for bad purposes, say that they don't really want to cure the patient. What they want is um, to have another person um, take the experimental drug, okay? because you know, unknown to the patient is part of the clinical trial or something. Um, so there might be some you know, bad motives here. Well, in that case, we think this is a case of manipulation. So the first story where the patient rationally endorses by a hope to switch in her attitude to risk, we think is acceptable. We think um, this influence by way of a decision-making weakness is not morally acceptable. So and I think that should be pretty clear. Okay. Um, so, and here's another way, here's another sort of possibility. This patient might just be obsessed with uh, preventing deaths at all costs. Okay, and exaggerates the efficaciousness found in a new trial. So, so it might be that, um, you know, they, um, they have a patient and they know they'll clutch the stores. The doctor is worried about their sort of performance record. They want to try everything. They don't want to be seen as someone who gives up, even though the patient wants to give up and doesn't want to have all these dreadful side effects. Um, and so they exploit the tendency to clutch at straws and get them to take this uh, other drug. Um, so once you've uh, imbued them with hope, their reference point shifts, go from the state of being unwell with cancer, think of that now, think of that as a loss, um, and be willing to take more risks. Okay? And so she's been uh, manipulated wrongfully in that case. Now, this is slightly different from this is another case that comes up. Um, so uh, th this is just more of a straightforward deception case. So it's different from that. The, uh, the clutching at straws case, no information has been withheld from the patient. It's just that a known decision-making weakness has been manipulated. But there are other cases that come up. Here's something people worry about. Um, you know, it's basically a patient who has got no hope. Um, in each way, and um, but the doctor pushes their buttons and gets them to hope that there'll be a miracle, okay, and just neglects to mention the sort of significant risks of uh, experimental procedure, okay. In that case, um, they could ignore, discount, rationalise away risks, so they're not engaging with risks at all, okay. So again, this is another way of manipulating a patient, uh, it's not quite as uh, devious as exploiting their, it's, it's more exploiting their circumstances rather than exploiting their decision-making weakness, but it's still wrongful, okay? But even though there are these wrongful ways of taking advantage of um, patients' propensity to change their attitude to risk, as a result of requiring a goal, they're also perfectly acceptable ways. Okay. Okay. Um, so sorry, I've done that already. Um, so um, yeah, so that's just the difference between patient B and the other case. Um, I'll just finish up. It said in the abstract I was going to say, so we're going to say something about religion uh, and hope. Um, that kind of dropped out of the paper because the paper got longer and longer. Um, but the gist of what we'd want to say is this. <coughs> Look, insofar as, and this often comes up. Um, if um, religion, religion is a common source of hope, patient to religious and more likely to be hopeful, um, insofar as religion is doing the work of getting patients to hope for um, an outcome that they would rationally endorse anyway, and which is um, you know, um, that they become better, uh, that they return to their previous state of health, then that's good. Cool. If religion is actually pushing into some other goal, then we think that's bad. The goals of religion are no longer aligning with the goals of healthcare. Okay, so that's what we're concerned with. But as I say, that simply dropped out of the paper as uh, reasons of space. Okay, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. And I look forward to your questions.
quickly check uh, if there are any questions in the uh, web.